Good morning, family. Aloha and happy Sabbath to each one of you. I want to thank God for this wonderful opportunity of being together on this, the first Sabbath of the new year, to experience a fresh revelation of Jesus. We have lots to share this morning, so we're just going to pray and jump into our presentation. I hope you brought your Bible, I hope you brought a notebook, and I hope you brought a spiritual appetite as we feast upon the living man of the bread of life this morning. I invite you to bow your heads as we pray together. Let us pray. Thank you so much, dear God, for breathing your breath of life into us today. Thank you for giving us another Sabbath, another year, another day to live. And Lord, we realize that time is very short, that indeed you are coming again. And Lord, we want to be ready. We understand, we recognize that you have called us, you have chosen us. Now I pray, dear Lord, that your faithfulness will be ours, that you'd fill this room with your Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with your Spirit. And as we open your word, that our hearts and minds will be open to receive the message of this hour, that we might be inspired, motivated, challenged, and blessed. Please, dear God, speak and give us ears to hear your voice and a heart that can know your heart. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our message this morning is entitled, Great in the Sight of the Lord. I invite you to take your Bible and open with me to the book of Mark, chapter 1, as we begin our study entitled, Great in the Sight of the Lord. Mark, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says this. Mark, chapter 1, and verse 1, the Bible says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. Our message this morning takes us back to the first century of the common era. It was a time of great instability and uncertainty in the world. And this somber uncertainty was mingled with, with a solemn expectancy for something that was going to happen amongst the people of God. Because the Jews of old thought to themselves that soon their Messiah would come. Soon the day of reckoning would arrive. Soon their enemies would be vanquished under their feet, so they thought. But before the Messiah would come to the world, the Bible says in this passage that He would send His messenger to prepare the way for His arrival. And we know that this prophetic promise was fulfilled in the life and in the ministry of John the Baptist. He was sent to prepare the way for the first coming of Christ. And so too, God is looking for some final forerunners in the last days to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. John was the first forerunner. God is calling us to be the final forerunners in these last days. And so this morning as well as tomorrow, as we examine the life and ministry and message of John the Baptist, we will see an example, a visual aid of what God is calling us to be in these solemn times. His life, in other words, was a shadowy type, and God is calling us to be the greater reality, to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus. In this passage, John is introduced simply as the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But what kind of voice was that of John's? John's voice was a voice calling for revival and reformation. It was a catalyst for revival. His voice was a clear voice announcing the coming of King Jesus. It was also a penetrating voice, a voice that would sigh and cry and for the abominations that were done in the church of that time. It was a voice that would break up the hardened soil of spiritual indifference. It was also a piercing voice that would cut men's hearts with Holy Spirit conviction. It was a startling voice calling for revival, repentance, and reformation. It was also a shaking voice causing some to be shaken up and others to be sifted out. His was a bold voice, not afraid to call sin by its right name, but it was also a balanced voice, a voice that not only comforted the afflicted, but also a afflicted the 
the comfortable. His voice, friends, was clear and crying, penetrating and piercing. It was bold and balanced. Also, it was a relevant voice, a voice that reached all types of different demographics, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the educated, the uneducated, the Jew and the Gentile, men and women, the religious as well as the irreligious. It was also a hopeful voice, a voice that would give light to those who sit in darkness. And it was also a faithful voice, a voice that would not keep silent until the mission was accomplished, the mission simply to prepare the path and the way for the Lord. That was the voice of God's first forerunner, John the Baptist. And so will it be the voice of God's faithful messengers and final forerunners in these last days. And my charge and challenge to each and every one of us this morning is for us to simply stand up and to let God make us His voice, His final generation of faithful forerunners. Friends, I don't know about you, but I want to stand up and be a amongst that group. Amen? It's time for us, friends, to run to the world, to announce the coming of King Jesus. It's time for us to be that voice, to give that loud cry message, to lift up our voice and loud let it ring that Jesus is coming again. But friends, in our world today with so many different voices speaking so many different things in confusion, the question I ask this morning is, how can we be that clarion voice? announcing the return of our King. Well, to answer that question, all we need to do is examine the life of John the Baptist. And we're going to ask the question, what made John who he was? And that will answer the question as to what God is wanting us to be as well. You see, when the angel Gabriel came to the parents of John, announcing his coming, the angel Gabriel prophesied concerning John in Luke chapter 1 and verse 15, and he said that John would be great in the sight of the Lord. Great in the sight of the Lord. John was destined for greatness, and so it is with us today. God has called us, friends, not to live an ordinary, mundane, boring life, but to live a life that is great in the sight of the Lord, and that's the life I want to live. How about you? Amen? But what made John so great? There are three things that I want to share with you. There are several things that made him great, but three things I want to share with you that I want to highlight uh, of with you today and tomorrow. The three things that made this voice so great, number one, was what John said about himself. Number two, what John said about Jesus. And then number three, what Jesus said about John. This morning, we're going to cover that first one, what John said about himself. And then tomorrow morning, we're going to cover the second and third, what John said about Jesus and what Jesus said about John. Now, friends, based upon what John said about himself, which we're about to read, we can conclude three things about John the Baptist that made him great in the sight of the Lord. And I'm going to give it to you right now, which is the three points of our presentation today. Number one... That which made God, uh, John great is that he was confident in his identity. Number two, he was secure in his simplicity. And number three, he was genuine in his humility. And those are the three things that make us great in the sight of the Lord as well. And so I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of John chapter 1 as we see what John said about himself. John chapter 1. As the voice in the wilderness was heard, the whole nation of Israel was stirred with excitement and anticipation. Many believe that the voice that they heard in the wilderness was one of the prophets risen from the dead. Others thought that perhaps this was the promised Messiah. He has come. And then in verse 19 of John chapter 1, the Bible tells us that the priests and Levites approached John asking John about his identity. They asked the question, who are you? What do you say concerning yourself? And notice how John responds to the question in John chapter 1 and verse 20. If you're there, would you please let me know by saying amen. John chapter 1 and verse 20, John said, or the Bible says, and he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said unto him, Who art thou? 
that we may give an answer to them that sent us. What do you say of yourself? Now, friends, I want you to notice, as the Levites and priests asked John this question, John could have easily responded and claimed to be the Messiah, and the people would have revered him and accepted him as such. He could have also claimed to be uh, uh, Elijah or a, a, a great prophet risen from the dead, and people would have followed him. You see, when John was confronted with these questions, he is faced with an opportunity of power and promotion and self-exaltation. In these questions, all that appealed to the carnal flesh of John was presented before him. It was an opportunity for him to exalt himself in the eyes of men. But John the Baptist was like one who saw and heard not because he understood that he did not have to be great in the eyes of men. He was already great in the eyes of the Lord. And and so he responds to their question. He doesn't even tell them his name. He simply says in verse 23, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. It says, make, his path, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet, what does it say? The prophet Isaiah. Notice, friends, John's answer to the questions about what he thinks about himself highlights why he was so great in the sight of the Lord. First of all, John knew his prophetic identity. He saw himself as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, the voice preparing the way for the coming of Messiah. His identity was rooted in prophecy. John understood that his existence was called forth by the prophetic word, and that which is, is what enabled him to fulfill his purpose. His purpose was rooted in his identity. His identity was rooted in the prophetic word. John, in other words, knew exactly who he was. And as a result, he knew why he was sent to the world. My question to you this morning, friends, is this. Do you know who you are? Do you know why that you're here? Allow me to remind us all this morning that we are not just a church. We are not just a conversation. We are a prophetic movement of destiny called and chosen by God Himself to fulfill a specific special mission to present a beautiful, glorious message for a very distinctive and solemn time. Our identity has been called forth by the prophetic Word of God. It's rooted in the book of Revelation chapter 10, Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 18. We find our identity not only as a church, not just as a conversation, but as a prophetic movement called to usher in the return of King Jesus to be the final forerunners. We have been called. We have been chosen. The question is, are we faithful? In order to be great in the sight of the Lord, Number one, we must be confident in our identity, not obnoxious in our identity, but simply confident, knowing who we are and why we're here. Thus was the mindset of the first forerunner, so too the final forerunners. But now we go to the second thing that made John the Baptist so great. He wasn't just confident in his identity. He was secure in his simplicity. You see, when he studied the life of John the Baptist, there was nothing flashy or extravagant about his life. He lived a life that was characterized by modest simplicity in his dress, in his diet, in his training, in his education, and his message. The Bible describes the diet of John the Baptist, and the point that we learn from that is that his diet was simple in nature. He lived by the principle of temperance because you see, friends, in order to give a clear message, we have to have a clear mind. In order to have a clear mind, we have to have a healthy body. Amen? And in order to have a healthy body, we must live by the principle of being temperate in all things. And that was John the Baptist. He gave a clear message because he had a clear mind, because he had a healthy body, because he was, lived a life of temperance. Not only that, but the Bible describes his dress, simple in nature and very distinct. He lived by the principle of modesty. And friends, the spirit of prophecy tells us that, that the dress of John the Baptist was such that it was an open rebuke to the flashy fashions and the dazzling displays of the time. You see, the scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders during that time, they loved to dress to impress others of their religious importance. But John understood that it wasn't about attracting attention to himself, 
but calling people's attention to the one that was coming after him. John was temperate in his diet. He was modest in his dress. That was the first forerunner. So too will be the final forerunners. He was a health and a dress reformer, but he was also an educational re reformer. It's interesting that when you read the book Desire of Ages, it describes the training of the first forerunner, John the Baptist. God did not send him to the teachers of theology or the rabbinical schools of the day. In fact, the spirit of prophecy tells us that th that would have actually unfitted him for his work. Instead, God called him to the desert so that he might learn from nature and nature's God. John the Baptist lived between the mountain and the multitude. He, and in this wilderness retreat, he studied God two great books, the book of nature and that of Revelation. He searched diligently the prophetic scrolls. He watched the passing signs of the times. He understood the day and hour in which he lived. And he also observed the character of men so that he can discover the best way to reach their hearts with the message of heaven. And with God as his instructor, John the Baptist received a well-rounded, holistic education. A what kind of education? Well-rounded and holistic. Now, friends, we have to understand this morning that John did not have an accredited degree that was recognized by the clergy of the day. But nonetheless, he was thoroughly educated and trained to live out his purpose and fulfill his mission. Now, please listen carefully and don't misunderstand. There's nothing wrong with pursuing an accredited degree. Can you say amen? If it's in within your reach, and if it's within your budget, go get it. It'll open many doors. And if you got one, you ought to thank God for another tool to use in ministry. But uh, friends, listen, I believe that as God's children, we ought to aim for excellence in all that we do. Can you say amen? Moral excellence, spiritual excellence, physical excellence, as well as academic excellence. But here, my friends, listen carefully, is a forgotten reality that we need to remember and be reminded of today, and that is this. God is not dependent on your degree, nor is He limited if you lack one. God is dependent upon our humility and our availability to be used by Him. We've been told in the book, Great Controversy, page 606, that when the time comes for the third angel's message to be given with its greatest power, it says the Lord will work through humble instruments. The laborers will be qualified by the unction of His Spirit rather than by the training of literary institutions. Nothing wrong with literary institutions. We need them all over the world, but God is not dependent on them to finish the work. He's looking for humble instruments who are willing to put self and self-sufficiency aside to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I love what it says in the devotional book, Maranatha. And on page 23, it says that God can teach you more in how long? One moment. One moment by His Holy Spirit than you could learn from the great men of the earth. You see, the reason why this ought to be encouraging to us is because you may not have the time, the means, or the need to spend many years in a literary institution. But the good news is that the Holy Spirit is available and accessible to us all. He is the greatest teacher, and we need to be careful not to limit the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? In the book, Gospel Workers, on page 488 and 489, it says this very challenging statement. It says this, God can and will use those who have not had a thorough education in the schools of men. A doubt of his power to do this is manifest unbelief. It is limiting the omnipotent power of the one with whom nothing is impossible. Oh, for this less, oh, excuse me, oh, for less of this uncalled for distrustful caution. It leaves so many forces in the church unused and it closes up the way so that the Holy Spirit cannot use men. It keeps in idleness those who are willing and anxious to labor in Christ's lines, and it discourages from entering the work many who would become efficient laborers together with God if they were given a fair chance. You see, those who live for Christ ought to aim for excellence in all things. But friends, let us never fall into the devil's trap 
of equating formal education with holistic education. Because not all formal education is holistic and seldom is holistic education considered formal. Let us never overemphasize formal education over holistic education to the point that we're, we adopt this mindset that if we do not have a piece of paper recognized by a secular accrediting institution that somehow we're not qualified for ministry and to work for God. The Spirit of Prophecy calls that mindset unbelief, limiting the Holy Spirit, hindering the work of God, uncalled for, distrustful, because friends, if that mindset was true, then John the Baptist was unqualified for ministry. Not only John the Baptist, but even Jesus, God in the flesh because they did not have a degree accredited by some institution, but nonetheless, they had God as their teacher. They learned from the experience of the patriarchs and prophets of old, and they had an experience with their master. Don't forget what I shared you the other day. Your greatest qualification is your experience with Jesus. Amen? The strongest proof that God has called one to ministry is written in the book of Acts of the Apostles, page 328. It says this, the conversion of sinners and their sanctification through the truth is the strongest proof a minister can have that God has called him to the ministry. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits, not by their letters. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain even when we did not choose God, God chose us. He ordained us to be fruit bearers. It is not the letters, but the fruit that is the evidence of Holy Spirit ordination. That's what John had. His training was simple, but it was profound in its simplicity. And because his training was of a higher order, so too was his message and his method. You see, John did not use fancy gimmicks or emotional theatrics to captivate the crowds. His message and approach was, approach was very different from that of the Pharisees. It was very simple. He simply spoke the truth, and he spoke it in love. John did not compromise the message in order to satisfy the itching ears of his audience. He did not sugarcoat the message in order for it to become more palatable for the people. He simply spoke the truth and he spoke it in love. And tomorrow morning, we're going to see specifically exactly what John spoke. But in this, we see that John was secure in his simplicity, confident in his identity. Number two, secure in his simplicity. And that's what's going to give us success, friends. I want you to notice Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, page 608, it says, Your success is in your what, everyone? Simplicity. As soon as you depart from this and fashion your testimony to meet the minds of any, your power is gone. Success is found in simplicity. When we try to change things and, 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 and uh, adopt things to meet the changing cultures and to satisfy the, 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 the postmodern mindset, friends, many ministries have no power because they're trying to replace the simplicity of God's Word with something else that appeals to the carnal flesh. John was confident in his identity. He was secure in his simplicity. But most importantly, number three, he was genuine in his humility. When people asked John who he was, he didn't even tell them his name. His simple response was, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He took no credit to himself. He didn't show, him, show them his resume. He didn't even tell them his name. He simply said, I'm the voice. It, it's not my name that's important. It's not my title or position. It's simply my voice, my message that's important. When the people approached John and said, John, people are leaving you and going to Jesus. It was then that John said in John chapter 3, verse 30, he said, he must what? Increase. I must decrease. You see, John was great in the sight of the Lord because he was small in the sight of himself. And this is what made him safe for God to bless. When you study the Bible, friends, the Bible tells us the stories of great men and women of faith 
that God used in powerful, potent, and profound ways, and that which they all had in common, it was humility and self-distrust. When you look at Moses, when the Lord called him, Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? I am not eloquent. I am slow of speech. And yet God was able to use him as a powerful deliverer to set the people free from the bondage of Egypt. Look at Solomon, the king of Israel. When God called him, his prayer, he did not ask for riches. He did not ask for power. He asked for wisdom. He said, Lord, I'm a little child. I know not how to come in or to go out. I need wisdom. And it tells us that Solomon was not wiser, wealthier, or more exalted than when he spoke those words. I'm just a little child. I don't know what to do. And he leaned, he leaned wholly upon the Lord's wisdom. You look at Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. When God called him, he said, oh, Lord God, I'm but a child. I can't speak. But the Lord says, don't worry. I'm going to put my words in your mouth. Humility self-distrust. Daniel, when he saw the Lord, he said, my comeliness is turned into corruption. I retain no strength. Isaiah said, woe is me. I am undone, a man of unclean lips. Peter, when he saw the glimpse of the divinity of Christ, he fell at his feet and said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And Paul, the mighty apostle, said, I am the chief of sinners and least of all the apostles. Even Ellen White said, I am a little girl. They're not going to listen to me. And even our Lord Jesus said, of my own self, I can do nothing. And yet these were the ones that moved the world. And so, my friends, if you feel yourself unworthy, insufficient, and inadequate to live up to the holy calling God has placed upon you, if you feel yourself insufficient, you're in good company because that was the mindset of all of those who were great in the sight of the Lord, humility and self-distrust. Prophets and Kings, page 175, I love this promise. It says, nothing is apparently more, what everyone? Helpless, yet really more, what is that word? Invincible than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly upon God. Nothing more helpless, but at the same time, invincible than the one who is genuine in humility. And so, such was John the Baptist. Three things. What were they? Number one, he was, help me, confident in his identity. Number two, he was secure in his simplicity. And number three, he was genuine in his humility. And that's what made him safe for God to bless. Friends, you realize that, 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 that God is eager and anxious to pour out all the blessings of heaven upon us. You know, sometimes when we pray, we're praying, Lord, bless me. But friends, I believe that, that we ought to modify that prayer a bit, a bit because God wants to bless us. But many times He doesn't because He can't trust us with those blessings. So instead of praying, Lord, bless me, we ought to pray, Lord, change my heart and make me safe for you to bless. And that which makes us safe for God to bless is when we have the mind of Christ, the humility of Jesus. It says in the book, Ministry of Healing, page 460, 476 and 478, so today, while the humble worker for God is following his employment, angels of God stand by his side listening to his words, noting the manner in which his work is done to see, what are, they, what are the angels looking for? To see if larger responsibilities may be entrusted to his hands. Not by wealth, their education, or their position does God estimate men. He estimates them by the purity of what? Motive and their beauty of character. He looks to see how much of his spirit they possess and how much of his likeness their life reveals. To be great in God's kingdom is to be as a little child in humility, in simplicity of faith, and in purity of love. I want to be like that. How about you? And that was the characteristic of the first forerunner. So too will it be the characteristics of the final forerunners in the last days. Friends, let me ask you, how many want and could use more humility in your life? 
And friends, we need to be careful that we don't become proud of our humility. Amen? I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, if you think you have no pride, then you most surely do. We need to be genuine in humility to recognize our unworthiness, our inadequacies, and our insufficiencies. Because it's then that God takes the weak things of the world and He shows Himself strong through their experience. Amen? I'll never forget receiving the email inviting me to speak at the General Conference session this past July in San Antonio. How many of you were there at the General Conference session? It was a wonderful experience, my first time going there. The General Conference, as many of you know, is held only once every five years. This past year, it was held at the Alamo Dome Stadium, which seats over 65,000 people, the former home of the San Antonio Spurs basketball team. And when I received this invitation, this email, inviting me to do one of the devotionals uh, for the General Conference, my initial reaction to that was I was shocked. I, was, I, I, I thought to myself, of the thousands of, of speakers available, why was I chosen? It had to be a mistake. I read it over and over again. I thought they must have sent it to the wrong person because why me? I don't have some high position of leadership in the church. I'm not an ordained pastor. I don't have any formal education that many esteem so important. All I have is a high school diploma, a two-year certificate from a small Bible college called Souls West, field experience, and a walk with Jesus. But I guess that's enough. Amen. But I honestly, I honestly felt, friends, that there were hundreds of others far more qualified and far more godly than I was to take this solemn responsibility. I felt unworthy and inadequate to speak at such a large stage at such a sacred event. But nonetheless, I accepted the invitation with, which, with excitement, but also a great level of trepidation. But as I prayed, I put it in God's hands, and the Lord gave me what I feel was a timely message for His church. A message calling us back to our mission to preach the word in all the world. When the general conference began, it was my first time attending. I was there with my wife, and we saw the tens of thousands of people crawling like ants all over the place. I tried not to think about the fact that I was, I was going to speak to them on the second Thursday of the general conference. I, I was nervous, but at the same time, I had a sense of peace knowing that if God could use Moses, surely he can use someone like me. And the, the morning that I stood up on that stage in front of tens of thousands of people, all the fear and nervousness vanished. The Holy Spirit took full control. I could sense a lot of people were praying for me. It was surreal, friends. It was like I was in some type of zone. It was just a God and I up there. Jesus was lifted up. The Spirit moved and the people were blessed. And it was a wonderful experience I'm eternally thankful for. But let me tell you what happened when I descended the stage where all the delegates were gathered. As I began to exit the building, it seemed like the whole world just opened up. Delegates from Africa and Asia and South America and Europe, they all started coming and asking me for my business card, inviting me to come to speak in their country. And I was excited, but I quickly became afraid. I was afraid. And here's the reason why. Because the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. I feel like I've been given too much too quick. It's not something I sought, but it's something that God brought. And friends, to be honest, uh, just to be very transparent with you, I I I'm not comfortable being up front. I don't want to be famous. I just want to be faithful. Amen. And naturally, I'm an introvert, very shy. Growing up in Hawaii, I had a disadvantage I had an advantage because I was close to the beach. But the disadvantage is that in Hawaii, we speak a different language there. It's called simplified English. We take a paragraph and we say it in one sentence. We take a sentence and we say it in two words. We take two words and we say it with our eyebrows. <laughs> it's basically broken English. And so growing up, I was very shy, slow of speech. I'm not the smartest person, and, and I would much rather be behind the camera taking pictures rather than in front of the camera. I don't want to be famous. I just want to be faithful. I don't want to be great in the sight of men. 
only great in the sight of the Lord. That night that I preached, I preached in the morning, but that night 3ABN was reviewing the day of, at the GC, and they made a comment on the devotional that I shared that morning, and someone on 3ABN called me a rising star in Adventism. And my human nature was flattered, but I quickly became afraid because we have been told, friends, that many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will go out in darkness. Jeremiah said to his scribe Baruch, Seekest thou great things for yourself? Seek them not. And the reason is because if we're not watchful, if we're not sober, the devil will make us think we're something special. We have seen so many bright and shining stars lose their light and fall into darkness. We've, so, we've seen so many spiritual mentors fall and turn back to the world. And so, my friends, let us stay humble. Let's allow Jesus to clothe us with humility day by day. Let's stay on guard and keep humble and stay with Jesus. The devil is coming after you, friends. He has a trap prepared for you because Satan knows that if he can, if he can get you, he will get all those whom you have influence over. And so stay with Jesus. Stay with Jesus. Stay with Jesus. Be sober. Be vigilant. The devil is like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Be sober. Be vigilant. But don't be afraid because Satan, even though he's a wily foe, even though he's a, a, a mighty enemy, he is also a defeated enemy. Can you say amen? The greatest one that you ought to fear is not the devil. He's a defeated enemy. The one that you ought to fear the most is the one you look at every single morning in the mirror. Self is the enemy we need fear most. I want to share with you a few more things as we bring this to a close soon. The Bible tells us that perfect love casts out fear. Amen. We don't have to be afraid of Satan, but we ought to be afraid of self. Now, there's a lot of things that people are afraid of in life. A lot of people are afraid of heights. Any of you afraid of heights? Afraid of flying? Well, friends, God has taken that fear out of my heart. You know, growing up in Hawaii, I'm, I, 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 was, I grew up jumping off of cliffs into water. We've done skydiving and bungee jumping and, and these types of jumping off buildings. And so I don't have a fear of heights like many people do. Now, there are others who are afraid of speed, afraid of going fast. I grew up riding dirt bikes racing, doing all of these types of activities, riding skateboards down hill and hills and whatnot. And so I'm not afraid of speed like many others are afraid of. And, and this next one, some of you will think I'm crazy, but many people, including myself, growing up in Hawaii, had a great fear of sharks. But in recent years, I, I've learned that, man, sharks are amazing. I love swimming with sharks. Here's a picture of my wife and I swimming with sharks. Sharks are amazing, amazing creature. I'm not afraid. I've, I've swum with uh, many types of reef sharks, and I've even swam with hammerheads and bull sharks and a tiger shark. And if you ever get the chance to go to Hawaii, let me know, and we'll go swim with some sharks together. How many of you want to do that? Sound good? All right. We have some adventurous people here. Some people are afraid of sharks. I'm not afraid of that. Others are afraid of death, but I, I've, I've boarded planes in the past where it wasn't certain that the plane would land. And I'll never forget, it was just a few months ago, in fact, my wife and I boarded a plane heading to Fiji. We're going to speak there. And about 15 minutes into the flight, we realized that we were flying a lot lower than we, than we, than we, than we should. And then we were sitting in the front row, and we saw the flight attendant in his seat, and the captain called him over the phone. And then we saw the facial expression of the flight attendant. His face becomes serious and somber. His eyes began to blink. His breathing became heavy. And we were just watching, wondering what was taking place. And then we heard him say, so you want me to prepare for an evacuation landing? And at that moment, we started to become nervous. He ended the phone call and looked for some manual. He was frantically trying to find something that would instruct him how to prepare for evacuation landing. Then he got on the, on the intercom and he told all those on the plane, we have a serious problem. The captain has informed us that the landing gears are stuck down and we need to go back to the airport. 
We're not sure what's going to happen, so we need to prepare for an evacuation landing. The landing gear is stuck down, and, 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 and you know, it's better to be stuck down than stuck up. Amen? <laughs> so at least he was stuck down and not stuck up. And so we're heading back to the airport, and he's teaching us how to do the brace position and what would happen in case we, we crashed. And since we're in the front row, he looked at us and he told us, I need your assistance in opening the evacuation emergency doors. And he got a verbal from every single one of us. His face, he was, there was no joking, somber and serious. And then he said this to us. He said, and if for any reason I get knocked out unconscious, would you please remove my body from the airplane? And that's when we knew it was serious. As we head back to the airport, we saw the fire engines, the fire trucks. And we didn't know what was going to happen. But I thought to myself, Lord, I'm on your errands. My life is in your hands. And if you are finished with me, then by your grace, I'm ready. And there was a serene calmness and peace in that moment that I can't describe with words. There was no fear of death in that moment because when your life is in God's hands, you have nothing to be afraid of. Amen? And while I can say that I'm not afraid to die, I'm not afraid of jumping off cliffs and, and going fast and swimming with sharks, there is one thing that I know that I am deathly afraid of. I'm afraid of falling. I'm afraid of a moral fall. I'm afraid of hurting my God, disappointing others, misrepresenting my church, embarrassing my family, making a fool out of myself. Friends, we've seen so many bright shining stars in Adventism fall. Let it be a warning to us that we are not indispensable. If we're not faithful, God can use somebody else to finish the work. And as we see others falling, let's not kick them while, while they're on the ground. Amen? Our response as we see others falling and failing is, Lord, but for your grace, there go I, to recognize our own humanity. And so recently, especially as these opportunities have come our way, I've been praying a different prayer. I've been praying, Lord, if you see that I'm ever placed in a compromising situation where I would end up falling, disappointing others, tarnishing your work, and are breaking your heart, Lord, let me die first. I would rather die. I would rather die than tarnish the work of God because I see the excruciating pain that it causes others. Pray for your leaders, friends. Pray for yourself. I've seen so many of my own spiritual mentors fall. Pray for those who are engaged in ministry because they are on Satan's most wanted list. The devil knows that if he can smite the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And so I told my wife recently that I've been praying that prayer. Just in case I die, she would understand why. And half-jokingly, she said, you've been praying that? So you want me to be a widow? She said, she said I'm, I'm glad that you distrust yourself. But you ought to also pray that God will give you victory and that you can run like Joseph ran as well. Amen. My friends, it's serious. But I'm thankful for this opportunity because I know that this is how God is saving me. So, friends, as we get ready to close, let's never seek fame. Let's only seek to be faithful, not to be great in the eyes of men, but great in the eyes of the Lord. My last quotation I want to read to you. Christ's Object Lessons, page 403, reads, There are many who have given themselves to Christ, yet who see no opportunity of doing a large work or making great sacrifices in his service. These may find comfort in the thought that it is not necessarily the martyr's self-surrender which is most acceptable to God. It may not be the missionary who has daily faced danger and death that stands highest in heaven's record. The Christian who is such in his what life? Private life in the daily surrender of self, in sincerity of purpose, in and purity of thought, in meekness under provocation, in faith and piety, in fidelity, in that which is least, the one who in the home life represents the character of Christ. Such a one 
may in the sight of God be more precious than even the world-renowned missionary or martyr. And so, my friends, do the duty that lies nearest. Be faithful in that which is least. Be confident in your identity, knowing that you're called. Be secure in your simplicity, knowing that you're chosen. And be genuine in your humility, because that is which makes us faithful. 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 John the Baptist was great in the sight of the Lord, because he was small in the sight of himself. How many of you want to be like John the Baptist? More importantly, how many of you want to be like Jesus? And so, let's pray and make John's declaration our proclamation as well. He must increase. I must decrease. Let's live a life that's pleasing and brings joy to our King. And may our lives be great, not in the sight of men, but in the sight of the Lord. If that's the experience you desire, would you bow your heads with me, with me as we pray? Lord, we thank you so much for calling us and for choosing us to be your forerunners, your victorious voices in these solemn times. Lord, we recognize that we're not worthy. We're inadequate. The angels could do far a, a much better job. But thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us, not just for the sake of those who will hear us, but you've chosen us because through the process, you're trying to save us. Lord, please save us from ourselves. Clothe us with your humility, your simplicity, your identity. And make us your children. Make us your movement. Make us your people. Bless us the rest of this, your Sabbath. We thank you for hearing. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all of God's forerunners say, Amen.